Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 673 for December 24th, 2017. Coming up in a few minutes. When I first open that bag, I'm, I'm really getting right in there and, and smelling. And you can tell, like it, it's, it's uncomfortable. It, it catches you off guard and it, it's something that is not pleasant. Um, it smells like um, beets or it smells like earthy. Um, I refer to it as a grandma's basement sometimes. Um, a, a new one that I've been thinking about is the smell of an old book. It's that old book smell. Um, it's just not pleasant to be in our alcohol, so that's my job. Christy Friganese is the gatekeeper at Corby's Hiram Walker Distillery in Windsor, Ontario. 2,700 trucks deliver more than 100,000 metric tons of grain to the distillery every year. But not a single one gets to unload until she gives the grain her seal of approval using lab instruments and her nose. It's a side of the whiskey industry you won't get on many distillery tours, but you'll meet the gatekeeper on this week's Whiskey Cast in depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, and a whole lot more on this holiday edition of Whiskey Cast. The holidays are a time to celebrate, to share something special with friends and family. This year, why not consider sharing something truly special, an engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Whatever you may think of the tax reform legislation, U.S. President Donald Trump signed into law this week after a lot of wrangling on Capitol Hill. There's no arguing that the whiskey industry came out as one of the winners. That's because the final deal included a cut in the federal excise tax on distilled spirits that the industry has been lobbying for for several years now. Starting in 2018, distillers will pay $2.70 per proof gallon on the first 100,000 gallons of spirits they produce each year. After that, the old $13.70 tax rate kicks in, but this is a move that will benefit almost all of the nation's craft distillers, who have argued for years now that the current system is unfair since small-scale brewers and winemakers get a similar break on the federal excise taxes they pay. Mark Gorman is the chief lobbyist for the Distilled Spirits Council in Washington, which represents both large and small distillers. I think it's going to be revolutionary for some. Um, if you're selling uh, 100,000 gallons, and uh, that's still a pretty small distillery, although it's it's bigger than most craft distillers are now, you could save uh, over a million dollars a year in federal excise tax costs. And every every distiller we've uh, we've talked to, every distiller who's a member of ours, insists that that uh, that you know those savings will go back into uh, new equipment and uh, new people to help make more of whatever it is they make. We've had that echoed in comments from craft distillers since the final votes Wednesday in Congress. P.T. Wood of Wood's High Mountain Distillery in Colorado told us this, and I'm quoting now, For my distillery, it means we can go ahead with a large reinvestment in equipment and infrastructure, allowing us to supply our spirits to a wider audience and grow our local economy. There were two other provisions that directly affect whiskey distillers. One is a technical change in tax law that will allow distillers to move bottled whiskeys between bonded warehouses without immediately owing excise taxes to the government. The second is a major change that Kentucky distillers have been trying to get for years. They'll now be able to take a tax deduction on the interest they pay when they take out loans against their inventory of maturing barrels. 
Kentucky Distillers Association President Eric Gregory is calling that a major victory for his members. The easiest way to explain this is think about if you're a homeowner and uh, you, you've got a mortgage on your house. Every year you can deduct uh, the mortgage interest on your taxes. Unfortunately, if distillers capitalize their barrels, uh, then they can't deduct that interest on those until the barrels are actually dumped. Uh, and then, you know, the blessing and the curse of Kentucky bourbon is you can't produce it overnight. So you're tying up important capital for six, eight, 10, you know, 20 years. And so that really is, has been a, a challenge for our members uh, as they continue to grow their inventory. So with this fix, albeit it's a two-year fix, uh, you're going to be able to deduct that interest on an annual basis, which will free up capital to create jobs and investment. And by capitalize, you mean, say, borrow against the uh, value of those barrels, or what do you mean? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes. So uh, mostly the bigger distilleries, obviously, that have uh, hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million barrels, uh, sometimes uh, seek uh, financial support to uh, to pay for those. Uh, so that's it's the same as mortgaging a house, correct? What is this going to mean for the uh, distillers in Kentucky who have uh, a whole bunch of barrels in stock? Well, it'll mean more money going back into the distilleries and the employees and uh, and the craft. Really, um, again, you know, we are building as fast as we can in Kentucky to meet the overwhelming global thirst for our, our amber nectar. Heaven Hill expanded by uh, more than a third this year as the automaker's mark has been doubling production almost every year. And uh, we can't build warehouses fast enough to handle all the new juice. So uh, with this money now uh, coming back into the distillers, we'll be able to reinvest that money and hopefully provide more Kentucky bourbon for the world to enjoy for the, the coming years. Of course, the industry will also benefit from other business-friendly changes in the tax reform legislation, including a permanent reduction in corporate tax rates to 21%. The whiskey-specific tax changes are only good for the next two years, though, and will have to be renewed by Congress before they expire in 2020. We had more new distilleries fire up their stills officially for the first time heading into the holidays. We hinted at this one a few weeks ago, but in Kentucky, distilling has begun at the new James E. Pepper Distillery in Lexington. Amir P. built the new distillery inside the shell of the original James E. Pepper Distillery in downtown Lexington's Distillery District. You can hear my interview with Amir in episode number 588 in the Whiskey Cast archives. In Scotland, R&B Distillers opened up the Isle of Rassey Distillery, while Drew Mackenzie Smith and his team have now started distilling at the Lindoris Abbey Distillery in Fife. You can listen to my August interview with Drew in episode 654. And earlier this month, we heard from Andrew Morrison of the new Clydeside Distillery in Glasgow, Scotland. They filled their first casks with New Make Spirit this week. Congratulations to all. It's been 12 years since they filled the first casks at Daft Mill Distillery in Fife, Scotland. And for years, the big question has been, when will the first whiskey be released? Well, we now know it'll be sometime in 2018, when Daft Mill's owners will bottle the first two casks they filled back in 2005. The distillery has signed a distribution deal with Berry Brothers and Rudd. No release date has been set yet, though. We'll have more details on an upcoming episode. And the first whiskey has now come of age at the Shed Distillery in Drumshambo, Ireland. The distillery in Connacht opened three years ago this month. That first cask was opened up for a quick tasting this week, then sealed back up to mature for a few more years. The distillery will open up its visitor's center in the coming year. In other news, the McAllen has released the second edition of its 40-year-old single malt, following a similar release this time last year. As you might expect, it was matured in sherry casks, and as you also might expect, it's going to be very limited and very expensive. Just 465 bottles will be available worldwide, with the U.S. recommended retail price set at $9,000 a bottle. And we've mentioned this one before, but Highland Park used the winter solstice on Thursday to officially unveil its new 17-year-old, the Dark Single Malt. It's matured in first-fill ex-sherry casks, bottled at 52.9% ABV. 
In the U.S., it'll sell for around $300 a bottle and will be followed this spring by its counterpart, the light. Napog Castle is releasing a special edition of its 12-year-old Irish single malt. It's matured exclusively in First Fill X bourbon barrels and carries a recommended retail price of $65 a bottle through reservebar.com. And finally, let's update you on last week's story about a Scottish hotel that claimed the Guinness World Record for the whiskey bar with the largest selection of whiskeys available for sale. The Glenesque Hotel has the record at 1,031. And last week we heard from Derek Mather of the Artisan Restaurant in Wishaw, Scotland, who has more than double that number available at his place. Derek was told that it could cost £6,500 just to have a Guinness World Records adjudicator visit the Artisan to verify a new world record, plus £3,000 a month in licensing fees to promote that record in his ads and social media. While no one from Guinness World Records was available for an interview this week because of the holiday, spokeswoman Kristen Ott told me in a series of emails that 96% of the 40,000 applications for New World Records each year are processed free of charge, and that it is not mandatory to have a Guinness World Records adjudicator verify a record in person. And the only licensing fee required for a record holder to promote a world record is if they want to use the actual Guinness World Records logo. Otherwise, there is no cost involved. I passed that information along to Derek Mather this week, and it appears he may be a bit more inclined to go for that record now. We'll keep you posted. The news is brought to you by Highland Park. Ready for a break from Christmas music now? Highland Park has something to get you in a better mood. They've collaborated with musician and producer Saul Davies to create the full-volume playlist on Spotify with 20 songs that inspired Saul's soundtrack to go along with Highland Park's new full-volume whiskey. And it just might make your New Year's Eve party even more memorable. Check it out on Spotify. Just enter Highland Park Whiskey in the search field and crank that volume all the way up to 11. As for the whiskey, you'll find that at a whiskey shop near you or at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Seven swans a-swimming, six geese a-laying, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. All seems a little excessive, doesn't it? When there's one bird they really want this Christmas, redbreast. The warm glow of ripe fruit, honeyed figs, and crackling cinnamon proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, and the perfect gift to slip under the tree. If you're sitting around bored during the holiday break, we can help with that. You'll find new episodes of Whiskey Cast HD and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel online to help you pass the time. This month, our tasting panel of The Three Wise Men, Angelo Veneziano, Mike Farley, and Sam Spears, tasted the Oban 14-year-old single malt, along with the Glenbergie 15 and Highland Park's 17-year-old full volume. You'll find the Whiskey Cast tasting panel on iTunes and Apple Podcasts and wherever you download your podcasts from, as well as WhiskeyCast.com. The Whiskey Cast tasting panel is brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. First off, it's time to start thinking about your end-of-the-year drams this week. What will you finish off 2017 with? And what will be your first dram of 2018? Tell us on the Your Voice page at WhiskeyCast.com or on our social media feeds, and we'll share some of your choices on the next episode. Also, if you're inclined to leave a dram out for Santa on Christmas Eve instead of the usual cookies and milk, well, what did you pick? Lori Van Teel, at Lori in Seattle on Twitter, tweeted, If Santa visits me, he's only getting American single malt. After I suggested bourbon instead of the milk, since Santa might just be a bit lactose intolerant, Connor Dempsey tweeted from Ireland, Meh, word is Santa is more keen on pot still Irish whiskey. Okay, bourbon or American single malt in the States, Canadian whiskey in Canada, Scotch in Scotland, and Irish whiskey in Ireland. 
Santa appreciates diversity in his whiskeys, too. And finally, I like Rhonda Moore's approach. She tweeted from Ottawa, Ontario, Think I'll just leave the whiskey cupboard open with a glass and a note that reads, Santa, help yourself. That's the best idea of all. Of course, Christmas is a time to share whiskey with your family, or potential in-laws in this case. Ryan Campbell at rcampbell919 tweeted this. Whiskey cast, my girlfriend's father claims to like smoky whiskey, so I'm taking Cory Vrecken to Christmas Eve dinner. Mwahahaha. At ardbeg underscore dot com, hashtag whiskey, hashtag scotch. Oh, this ought to be good, Ryan. Let us know when you uh, get out of intensive care, okay? Jim Allen of the Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh emailed from Scotland after he caught me out on an error last time around. During our Lagavulin commercial at the end of the in-depth segment, I was talking about the distiller's edition and said it was finished in Oloroso sherry casks. Here's part of Jim's email. Is this a different distiller's edition that you get in the States? Every Lagavulin distiller's edition that I've tried or read about, and I've tried quite a few, was finished in a Pedro Jimenez cask. Jim is right, of course. It was my mistake. And he went on to add, Love listening to your podcasts as I travel on the train to and from my work at the Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh. Your podcast is a valuable source of information that I regularly use to brief my staff on new developments. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Jim. And if you catch me in an error, or there's something else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. If you'd like to hear your comment on the show, just record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And, of course, you'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. This week's Your Voice is brought to you by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. The Brandy Library in New York City will wrap up 2017 with a tasting of the year's best whiskeys on December 30th. Seven Grand and Las Perlas in Austin, Texas, are teaming up for the Tullamore New Year's Eve party on New Year's Eve. The Kensington Wine Market in Calgary, Alberta, will host an introduction to whiskey tasting January 9th. The Harrow Whiskey Festival is January 12th and 13th in London. I'll be at the Victoria Whiskey Festival in Victoria, British Columbia again this year from January 18th through the 21st with special coverage once again that weekend, right here on WhiskeyCast. There's a Port Ellen tasting at the Morin Center in Quebec City, Quebec on January 25th, and the Red Stag Pub in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania will host a Talisker and Lagavulin tasting on February 1st. Right now we have 142 different events on the searchable calendar at WhiskeyCast.com. There's bound to be something going on near you. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. Just like a perfectly executed double play. Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded, and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. It's winter now, and in the northern hemisphere, the crops are in for the year. Of course, whiskey lovers depend on the farmers who grow the grain that distillers turn into whiskey. But all too often, we tend to take that part of the process for granted. If you've ever been on a distillery tour, 
you might have seen a grain truck pull up to make a delivery. But there's a lot more to it than that. That's because there's one person at every distillery with an important job. One that never gets a lot of acclaim either. That's because there are no awards honoring the gatekeepers. Each year, 2,700 grain trucks pull up to the Hiram Walker Distillery on the banks of the Detroit River in Windsor, Ontario. The distillery will use around 100,000 metric tons of grain a year to make 45 million liters of Canadian whiskey. How you doing? I know, right? And there's one person who oversees all of that grain, Christy Friganese. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. You're training? I'm training. Training. Okay, very good. Well, you're in the right hands. Oh, perfect. Nice to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. You guys can head right back. You remember the routine? Yeah. Okay. You need a vest and safety glasses and safety shoes. Um, But he'll take you through the ropes. Uh, We just started the 9 o'clock guy, so you'll be up for 10. Okay. Okay? That's good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. She's the process engineer in charge of the distillery's grain operations. I'm the gatekeeper, um, and my job is to keep all of the individual grains that uh, our master blender requires or or requests. Um, I have to maintain them within the, uh, you know, Canadian Grain Commission standards, first and foremost. But there's also another element that um, Hiram Walker owns, and that's to do any rejections based on smell alone. So that uh, human element is really um, important in my job. And um, it's first and foremost as far as um, if it's an off character or something that Don or Master Blender uh, really just can't handle in being present, it's my job to make sure it's not there. So if I miss it in the forefront, um, it's going to follow through to the end product. And yeah, we don't want that. But how do you tell? Okay. Just, how do you tell? With it's the, interesting. With yeah, I want me to. You know you you're tell? gonna laugh, but I, I use my main tool, which is my nose, and it's something that you you get used to. It's it's on the job training as far as that character, but it's uh, uncomfortable. It's um you know corn should be that sweet smelling character. It's comfortable to be in. You can basically be in a room of corn that is acceptable. Um, when you open that that sample set which this is a probed sample uh, from the truck. It would come out. Um, it would be a representation of the entire truck. Um, when I first open that bag, I'm, I'm really getting right in there and, and smelling. And you can tell, like, it, it's, it's uncomfortable. It, it catches you off guard, and it, it's something that it's not pleasant. Um, it smells like um, beets, or it smells like earthy. Um, I refer to it as a grandma's basement sometimes. Um, a, a new one that I've been thinking about is the smell of an old book. It's that old book smell. Um, it's just not pleasant to be in our alcohol, so that's my job. My job as a gatekeeper to make sure it's not there. Uh, if it is for any reason, it could happen to um, the farmers um, in handling. Uh, they definitely can cause it themselves by just not noticing that maybe one of their silos were in need of maintenance or for whatever reason it happened, it's present, it's theirs. They own it, and I ship them up the road to an uh, ethanol plant who will gladly take it. Yeah, and the ethanol plants will take that stuff, right? They'll take it. They don't care. They yeah. don't. They don't even have that testing element. They don't have that. It's outside of the Canadian Grain Commission standards. So you're the farmer. You're you're entitled to fair market value for this kernel of corn, but that smell, that jasmine, that test that we do is outside of that. It's specific to us. It's specific for our product, and it's our job to maintain that it's not there. Now you get all the grains in here though, right? Uh, every grain. Um, this is the entry uh, position for the grain. So we have um, 18 silos uh, to, to use. Um, we basically rotate the material through as quick as possible. Um, each one has a different harvest time. Um, so, you know, price-wise we, we bring things in differently. But for the most part we keep a standard flow of material uh, on a daily basis to production. The 18 grain silos Three banks of six are gray concrete and tower over the riverfront. They were built back in the 1950s, complete with an open elevator, and master blender Dr. Don Livermore is taking us to the roof. You couldn't build a facility like this today, could you? No, if you were to have a grain uh, silo near a distillery, it'd be a metal silo, right? Uh, And certainly a lot closer. 
Uh, you would never transport grain 500 yards uh, to the distillery. Watch your step. There you go. It must have rained yesterday. Yeah, so this is our, the uh, view of a distillery. The largest building down there is the distillery itself. Um, that's about 500 yards from the grain elevator. The grain is actually pumped underground. You can actually can kind of see the uh, steel plating and stuff along the pier, along the waterfront there. Uh, today, you'd never design a grain elevator 500 yards away from your distillery. It doesn't make a, a lot of economical sense, right? Uh, the large stack, that's our powerhouse. I always say that the three biggest expenses to the distillery are, are, are the three Gs, grain, gas, glass. And certainly we use natural gas as our soul. From years ago, we have some old photos. You could actually see coal lined up along the pier. They used to offload it on the pier. Obviously, coal's no longer acceptable uh, as a form of fuel. So when they do the uh, fireworks on uh, 4th of July and on... Uh, yeah, it's day, usually down, down in front of the uh, GM buildings here. To, you uh, guys come up here for the fireworks? No, no, no. The employees actually uh, sit on the yards down here by the... Uh, you see where that flame is, that's where they kind of sit in there. There's our bottling, uh, there's our blending and drain and fill. Those used to be the uh, warehouses, that's no longer. We do have our warehouses are about 10 miles from here. One level down, there are sonar probes at the top of each silo. You can hear the pinging now once you're up close, don't you? <laughs> Those probes tell Christy how much grain is in each silo and where there's room for more. After Christie's used her lab instruments to check the sample of grain off the truck, including the one with her most sensitive tool, her nose, only then does the driver get the green light to unload his grain. Yep, yeah, you're all set to offload. Everything was okay. Don't forget your gloves. That's just half of the gatekeeper's job. Christy Freganese's team is also responsible for the leftover spent grains. And you won't see this part on the typical distillery tour. This is kind of behind the scenes tour part um, where they're actually removing the material and putting in trucks. So One out of every three pounds of grain used at the distillery leaves as spent grains, about 150 metric tons a day. There are two massive mountains of grain inside this concrete block building, reaching the ceiling 40 feet above the ground while one worker moves them around with a front end loader. That's an auger pit there, Mark. Yeah, an auger pit. There's bucket elevators um, that the material will go into. He's ensuring off of our dried and cooled pile that the material is going to get separated and um, blended. It almost looks like the escarpment, I, I think, of all the different serrations of color, but really that's because we ran rye, corn. Um, we did a lot of Rye runs this week, so it's a little darker. You can actually see the rye on top of this pile clearly. Mm -hmm. This one has a high rye content because of the dark color to it. Yep. And this one will have is all corn. I can tell by the yellow yellow color, right? Yeah. And it's important to get it all blended up. Yes, and that's what he's doing. So on top of the the pit there, um, you've got a grate, and it's going to blend. It's going to go through a bucket elevator, and it gets separated on the rooftop and and really separated out into an even mass, so then you'll, you know, you'll blend up that color and they'll be good to go. And what happens if you don't separate it? Um, as far as the color goes, from what I've heard is that just some animals are more particular for noticing that color change and they, they won't go to eat it. But, um, you know, we do send to feed mills, so the feed mill itself, sometimes we go, sell to off farm, directly to farm, so it will go as is. Sometimes at the feed mill, they, they mix it and blend it with other other products as well. But the cows can tell. Cows can tell. Yep. Cows and pigs can tell. It would be interesting if the flavor of rye would be, uh, you know, that sour dough. I don't know. You know, maybe. Corn. Yeah. It would be interesting. Yeah, it would be. It's hard to but, tell. But yeah. It's hard to tell a cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to ask. We'll have to ask her next cow. <laughs> yeah. On the other side of the wall, the trucks pull in to load up the distiller's grains. So nobody ever gets to see this part, huh? No. Not many, no. So the operator is watching the scale right now um, and he's determining when to move to the next level. This is also a quality control point as well. I mean, 
before we started loading, our operator looked in the truck to make sure the truck was uh, ready for receiving our material so that we could guarantee that it gets there um, in the right standard that we sent it out. It's going to get nice and low. We're going to keep the emissions down for the area. We're going to keep all the dust nice and low in the truck so it doesn't uh, go around to our residents of the area or to the water close by. We make sure that that dust collector is in operating condition. So yeah, we, we have a lot of customers. Um, for the most part, we uh, the one I talk about the most frequently is the fact that we have drivers from New York. Um, they come all the way from Buffalo daily. Uh, we just heard from a driver earlier talking about how he passes four ethanol um, locations to, they, he goes by all of theirs so that he can come and get our material. We don't use any um, antibiotics or sulfuric acid in our process, so it makes it more um, ideal for the cattle or, or pigs wherever it's heading. Thanks to the gatekeeper, Christy Friganese, and Dr. Don Livermore for that special behind-the-scenes look inside the Hiram Walker Distillery. And if you'd like to see more of the process for yourself, just watch the latest episode of WhiskeyCast HD. It's available on YouTube, iTunes, and of course at WhiskeyCast.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, I've been in competition judging mode this past week and have not had the chance to taste many other whiskeys. But let's take a look at one of the whiskeys from the Hiram Walker Distillery, the new J.P. Weiser's 15-year-old Canadian whiskey. It's a combination of corn and rye whiskeys distilled and matured separately in a mix of new and used oak, along with First Fill X bourbon barrels, and it's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose has notes of toasted oak, buttered popcorn, soft spices, and hints of toffee and caramel candy. The taste starts off sweet with toffee, caramel, dried apples, and apricots, along with subtle touches of clove, nutmeg, and wintergreen mint that add a nice balance. The finish is long and smooth with gently fading spices and just a touch of dried fruits. I'm scoring the J.P. Weiser's 15-year-old a 90. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, makers of Whiskey Advocates 2017 Whiskey of the Year, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. The 12-year-old Barrel Proof bourbon was pitted blind against competition from around the globe and was consistently ranked number one by the magazine's testers. Meet the whole Elijah Craig family at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. I had the chance to try Anox Raskan Peated Single Malt recently. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose has a subtle peatiness along with notes of grilled pineapple, heather, honey, vanilla, and just a hint of smoked salmon. The taste has a good peaty smokiness and touches of honey, vanilla, smoked salmon, and just a hint of citrus fruits, while the finish has a nice lingering smokiness and touches of grilled fruits. I'm scoring the Anak Raskan a 90. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll have more tasting notes next time around, but until then, you can look through my complete list of more than 2,000 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. And keep in mind that list does work on your smartphone, so you can use it when you're at a whiskey shop or looking over the whiskey list at a pub, too. You'll also find links for the latest episodes of WhiskeyCast HD and the WhiskeyCast tasting panel at our website, along with the latest whiskey news, events, cocktail recipes for the holidays, and a whole lot more. Please take just a minute this week to leave a review or rating for WhiskeyCast on iTunes or your favorite podcast site. Those ratings do figure into search results, that can help other whiskey lovers discover the show when they're looking for podcasts online. And let's keep the cask strength conversation going all week long. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. 
Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know know Redbreast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2017. And comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and happy holidays. <laughs>